once again it's on you know what time it is it's time to play some toss welcome everyone to episode 40 and the third anniversary of the tristan on sports show toss it is your main man t square tristan thomas your friendly neighborhood back with some fresh heat straight from the kitchen you know how we get down so first of all thank y'all for joining us so very much let's get into it let's get into the state of the state and it was hashtag Wisconsin on Sunday and this past weekend. Oh, man, we got to get started with this. Let's go straight to the Green Bay Packers. If you were watching my space on Instagram at the two zero double, you would know I predicted a Green Bay Packers win. I said it will be twenty seven twenty. You would know that I said that Chicago's offense did not scare me. You would know that I felt that this defense could get it together if they show true pressure packages. You know I said that Chicago's defense worried me because of Khalil Mack and that that, that awesome linebacking core that they now have. You would know that I said as long as you have Aaron Rodgers on the field, you are a Super Bowl contender. I said all that on Quick Toss on my Instagram at the 200 double on Instagram TV, Quick Toss. Brand new season. And all of that played out in such a dramatic fashion this past Sunday. The Green Bay Packers did, in fact, beat the Chicago Bears 24-23, one-point game. But it was a lot more dramatic than what I thought it would be and what other people thought it would be. Chicago came out. And again, on quick toss, I said Mitchell Trubisky, he's got a lot more learning and growing to do. But can he be something? Yes. They came out with their first offensive drive after a three and out for for Aaron Rodgers and that Green Bay Packers offense. And they drove it right down the throats of the Packers defense. Jordan Howard, another guy who I said would be a factor. I said he was their one main source of offense and he was showing you why gashing those guys He pretty much did it all night. Mitchell Trubisky finishes off that first offensive series for the Bears with a rushing touchdown. He's constantly finding receivers all night long, the likes of Allen Robertson and Robertson and, and, and others. Tariq Cohen, another guy I spoke about on Quick Toss. They were doing some things on offense that made you believe, hey, you know, Matt Nagy might be the answer. This, this team might actually have a pretty decent offensive unit to go along with that vastly underrated defensive unit led by Vic Fangio. So then you come back and the Packers still can't do anything, still haven't been able to put points on the board. Second quarter, Rodgers gets sacked for the second time in the half. And this one's bad. 300-plus pound defender falling on his leg, tries to get up, hobbled, goes back down to the ground. Obviously in pain. Rusher, the trainers are rushing out. You could hear more than a pin drop. At Lambeau Field. You could hear the air particles flying through the air at Lambeau Field when Rodgers got down and wasn't getting up. And then when he went to the cart, it was driven to the locker room area on that cart. I got so many texts from so many people. Hey, this is over. Season's done. He's on the cart. How many times do you see a guy get on that cart and and come back? It's rare. Usually when you're taking that cart ride to the back, you are not coming back, not only for this game, but quite possibly for a significant amount of time. Everybody thought the season was lost. Here we go again. Rogers on the ground, then taking a cart ride to the back. Played out just like last year in Minnesota when Anthony Barr hit him. And I responded to a couple of those texts. I was like, yep, but I didn't give it context. What I meant by that, when I said, yep, is, If Rodgers can't come back, yeah, it's done. You might be able to win a couple games here or there, but does really does anybody really have true confidence in Deshaun Kaiser at this point? It's his first year in a Mike McCarthy offense. We already seen what this offense looked like with Brett Hundley, who's now traded. It was impotent, can't rise to the occasion. We got to see that for the remainder of the second quarter and for a a chunk of the third quarter. Kaiser throwing the football straight to Khalil Mack's hands. And and let's give some credit where credit is due. Again, if you watch Quick Toss on my Instagram television, 
you would know that I said Khalil Mack may not have a hold of Vic Fangio's defense. But sometimes you have to go out there and play on instinct, and that's exactly what he did. He is absolutely devastating to offensive game plans throughout the entire league. I said they would have trouble blocking him one-on-one. Guess what? They had trouble blocking him one-on-one in that first half. Kaiser throws the ball directly to him after the pressure. Pick six. Bears are up 17 to nothing at the half. Oh, here we go again. Here we go again. The, the, The season is over before it really got a chance to really get started. Second half begins. I mean, and, and make no mistake about it. It was a tale of two halves. That offensive line could not block to save their lives. They, not, they could not block to save Aaron Rodgers' life. Hence the reason why he got sacked twice. Hence the reason why he ended up hurt. A lot of the speculation is it's a sprained MCL. That's a best case scenario. If it is, in fact, a sprained MCL, usually that's about a two to four week recovery. You hope he doesn't miss any time. Currently, they don't know if he's going to play. I think he will. It's against the Vikings. He's got a little bit of get back to get against those guys, especially after what happened last season. But I digress. Going back to my point, that offensive line cannot block to save their lives. Roquan Smith comes in. He gets a sack. Cleo Mack is dominating you. Akeem Hicks is dominating. Secondary doesn't have to do much of the work because the Bears are constantly getting to the quarterback and making devastating plays that way. The defense couldn't seem to stop anybody. But again, you have to be careful on rating this defense in the first half. It's almost kind of unfair to do so. But for the purpose of this conversation, we have to. They did not play well together. The whole reason why I say it's kind of unfair to judge those guys off the first half in this game is because this entire first defensive unit did not play together all preseason long. They held a lot of those guys out a lot of games, same way they did with some of those starters on offense. This was really the the defense's first game together, the first unit's first full game together. And they did not have it in that first half. You gave up 17 points in that first half. It's not like you were getting blown out, but it was still 17 to nothing. It's a sizable lead. Third quarter rolls around. The Bears are able to add a field goal to that. It's 20 to nothing. But before that happens, you saw Aaron Rodgers walk out of that tunnel. And when you saw him walk out of that tunnel, still suited up to play, still in his pads, still in his jersey, Ready to play. You said, oh, man, he's coming back. He's coming back into this game. He, get, he gets on the sideline. He starts warming up. Oh, man, he's getting ready. He grabs his helmet. Oh, he's coming back into the game. Oh, my goodness. We actually may have a shot at this. But again, at that point, it was 20-0. Third quarter, Packers start moving the football a little bit. You start getting some hope weren't really able to establish a running game because of the score. You had to put the ball up in the air because you needed to get points quickly. Into the third quarter, or in the third quarter, into the fourth, Rodgers throws a long touchdown in the only spot his receiver could get it. And there's really only one quarterback who could make that throw, and that's Aaron Rodgers. Up the corner, into the end zone, Geronimo Allison, touchdown. It's 27, or at that point, 2010, because Packers were able to get a field goal. Uh Uh-oh, we got a game. Allison just scored. Rodgers, who does not have his mobility, which is one of his greatest strengths, goes back into his bag and, and, and uses the tools that makes him the best quarterback in the league. It's not just about his mobility. His mobility and his ability to be accurate while throwing the football on the move is something that very few, if not, no one could really do on his level. Let's be clear about that. No one could do it on his level. But you don't lose your accuracy just because you don't have your mobility. You don't lose your smarts, which is another thing that people fail to really speak about is his IQ for this game. I see so many people, especially in the, oh, the Brady's a better quarterback camp, say, oh, well, Rodgers isn't as smart as Brady about the game. Are you kidding me? How many times Rodgers is aware of the field at all times. Rodgers knows, okay, if these guys are substituting, this guy's not going to be able to get off the field in time. I'm going to snap the ball and get us five free yards. 
because you guys have too many men on the field. How many times does he look off defenders, it goes the other way, and, and gets chunk yardage, if not touchdowns? Because that's exactly what happened on that Geronimo Allison touchdown. He's looking to the left of the field, bringing the safeties that way to get a one-on-one matchup with Geronimo Allison and the DB for Chicago. That's exactly what happened. He looks left. He draws the safeties that way. It's now one-on-one. Throws the perfect football, the perfect pass to Geronimo Allison. You couldn't walk it up to him any better than that. And it's a touchdown. Now it's a 2010 game. Now you're getting your number one receiver, Devontae Adams, involved. Rodgers, with limited mobility, moves just enough within the pocket, dumps off a quick little pass, puts it in a space to where Devontae Adams can go and make a move. He does, gets into the end zone. It's now 2017. Oh, man, we got a game. We got a game. The Bears are able to add a field goal to make it 23-17. But you left too much time on the clock for Aaron Rodgers. They could not salt the game away. They could not get into the end zone. And it's very curious because they were getting gashed by the run. Jordan Howard was running it down their throats. It's a third and short situation and you don't run the football. You try to get cute and you pass the football. And you fail and you have to settle for a field goal. So now the Packers have to get a touchdown in order to just tie the ball game which is a lot tougher than the field goal. And Matt Nagy is going to look at this, and he, he's just going to kind of scratch his head about the whole entire situation. But that play right there, if you get a touchdown, you win this game. That salts the game away. That salts the game away. It's over at that point. But you did it. You decided to get cute. You start to try to pass on third and short instead of running it on third and short with Jordan Howard, who was gashing the Packers on the ground, especially in that drive. You left too much time on the clock for Aaron Rodgers. He goes in, does what he does. Again, limited mobility. And kudos to Mike McCarthy for continuing to call these plays and his now revamped playbook. People have a a misconstrued conception that he was not calling these kinds of plays in the first half. He was calling these plays in the first half. Thing is, with these plays, there's always an out to get something bigger. There's always a scramble drill to go and get something bigger built into these plays. A lot of these plays were being called in the first quarter, but Rodgers had his mobility. He's always looking for that home run. More times than not, he's looking for that home run. And that's what you saw. They were looking for the big play instead of taking what was being given to them. In the second half, he did a lot better job taking what was given to him, using his limited mobility, putting the ball in spots to where the receivers can make a move and get you some chunk yardage. And that's what happened on that 75-yard game-winning touchdown pass to Randall Cobb. Play was kind of broken. Rodgers couldn't really scramble the way he wanted to, but he was moving around the pocket a little bit. Got excellent protection on that play. The offensive line really blocked exceptionally well that entire second half. But on that play, they gave him, I believe, almost five seconds to throw the football. If you give Aaron Rodgers four and five seconds to throw the football, you are going to get hurt. That is exactly what happened. Randall Cobb and and all the receivers, kudos to them for being able to continue to do the the scramble drill, continuing to try and get themselves open to a spot where Rodgers could get the football. And and that's exactly what happened. Randall Cobb goes into the scramble drill after after the play gets broken. Rodgers puts it on him. He makes a move. Nothing but green grass ahead. Touchdown, 24-23 at that point. Now you need the defense to go and make a defensive stand. And at one point they did. It was fourth down. They, they, they did it. The incomplete pass. Oh, but wait a minute. Clay Matthews with one of the dumbest things <laughs> that he will ever do. Roughed the passer well after the ball was gone out of Mitchell Trubisky's hand. Pretty much comes, comes over and soul claps that dude right in the head. Now you've given them four fresh downs. Now you're giving them a chance to get into field goal range because that's all they needed to beat you was a field goal. The defense stands up, gets that play on fourth down. Nick Perry with the strip sack fumble. Who's the first person to come over and hug him? Clay Matthews because he know he just bailed his ass out. Nick Perry bailed Clay Matthews out on that. Packers go to lose that game. 
it, that play by Clay Matthews would have been a thing that we're all talking about right now. But instead, they win the game. And we're all talking about Aaron Rodgers and how incredible he was. 286 yards, three touchdowns. All three touchdown passes came in the fourth quarter. Over 260 plus of his passing yardage came in, in the second half. Was not a very good first half of football for the Green Bay Packers. The Packers gave up 17 points in that first half. They only gave up six points in the second half. It was a tale of two halves. And, and that's how you talk about the day that, that Devontae Adams had five catches, 88 yards, a touchdown. Geronimo Allison has 69 yards in the touchdown. Randall Cobb, nine catches, 142 yards in the touchdown. For all the people out there saying that he's washed it, no. You leave him in the slot, he's going to make plays. He showed you that all night long on Sunday. That is where he needs to be. It's a guy who's 28 years old, and people are sitting here talking about he's like 38 years old and has nothing left to give. Still in his prime. Still could give you everything that you can handle in that slot position. This was a fantastic win. This was a gritty win. The fact that Rodgers knew he had to come back out and, and play to give this team some hope and some inspiration to win this game. He thought the entire time they would win this game. He said the thing he was thinking about when he came out of that tunnel was seven times three, which is 21 points because at the time the Bears had 20. You get 21, that clock hits triple zero, you win the game. So he was thinking about going to score three touchdowns. And what happened? Score three touchdowns. Mason Crosby had a field goal. Final score, 24-23. It, uh, it was just some of the most dramatic football you will ever see. It was a head-scratching collapse by, the, by that Chicago defense, who they were still bringing pressure, but not quite the way they were in the first half. But again, you have to give it up to the, the Packers' offensive line. They blocked fantastic in that second half. Some of the best blocking I'd seen from this line in a long time, collectively. I want to see that on a consistent basis week in and week out. Stop getting your quarterback hurt and hit and abused and battered. Packers have another tough, ch- tough test coming up on Sunday at Lambeau. Noon. Minnesota Vikings, who many people are picking to be the favorites in this division. And quite frankly, I kind of have them as the favorites in this division as well. They are a balanced team. You now have Kirk Cousins. At the QB spot, we know how productive he's been in the National Football League. It's definitely not a step down from Case Keenum. It's it's definitely a step up. Stephon Diggs is a playmaker. Adam Thielen is a playmaker. Kyle Rudolph is a playmaker. You got a two-headed running game with Dalvin Cook and Latavius Murray. And you have a stout defense. Led by Mike Zimmer. And if you heard this program before, as most of you have, and I thank you for that, you know what I'm going to say here. Mike McCarthy offenses have usually struggled against Mike Zimmer defenses. Goes way back to his days as a defensive coordinator for the Cincinnati Bengals. And it continues now in Minnesota. It's no easy task. And that task will get a lot more difficult if Aaron Rodgers is unable to play. But for my money, I think he's going to play. I think they're just bringing him along very slowly. They're allowing him to get as much treatment and rehab in on that knee as possible. They're going to make the Vikings sweat it out. All right, let's prepare for both Rodgers and Deshaun Kaiser. We don't know which one we're going to play. I don't think Mike Zimmer's going to sweat it out much because he's going to be prepared no matter what. But it's going to be a tough test. What we cannot see this Sunday against the Vikings is that first half Packers team from the Bears game on Sunday. Cannot see that. That is not what is going to win you games. I know it's so surface and elementary to say that, but it is so fundamental to say this. You cannot allow yourself to come out flat like that, not give maximum effort like that, and think you're going to beat the Vikings because the Vikings are a team that are not going to beat themselves. They will not beat themselves. Mike Zimmer is going to bring the pressure when he needs to. Mike Zimmer is going to be very, very smart on his calls on defense. This offense is definitely 10 steps up from Chicago's offense currently. 
you are going to be challenged. It's a divisional game. It's another rival. These games are pivotal, are pivotal, especially for when it comes down to stretch of the regular season. You have to come out like you did in that second half and play like that for 60 minutes. Can you do that? Will you do that? I'm encouraged by what I saw by that defense. Again, six points given up in that second half of the Bears game. Can they do that again? Can that be the kind of defense they bring week in and week out? We know the talents on this offense. We know that if Aaron Rodgers is there, you're, you're pretty much going to be automatic 25 to 27 points. Can you do what you did in the second half all game long on Sunday against Vikings? I don't know. I don't know. I guess we'll have to talk a little bit more about it on this week's quick toss coming up later this week on Instagram TV again at the two zero double. But the Packers with a fantastic nail biting, dramatic win, 24, 23 over the Chicago Bears to open up the 2018 season. Ooh, man, had to catch my breath on that one. <laughs> it was it was that much excitement. You have a huge test on Sunday against the Vikings. That That's going to be a tough one. That's going to be a real tough one. And that's 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 uh, for lack of a better term. Continuing here on State of the State on Toss, let's get over to the Milwaukee Brewers who have been playing some really stellar baseball. Lost to the Cubs last night, 3 to nothing, but the day before they had won against the Cubs, 3 to 2, to pull within a game of the National League Central Division. They are now back to two games behind after the Cubs won last night. They still have a one and a half game lead over the Cardinals. For the top wild card spot in the National League, which means if the season were to end right now, the Brewers would be at home in the playoffs for a one game wild card playoff against the Cardinals for a chance to move on. And you will more than likely be playing the Cubs. So this may be a little bit of a playoff preview. And these games have been very, very postseason like again, low scoring defense matters, clutch hitting matters. If you've had that. In both of these games, at least Shashin threw that ball to second base on a pickoff attempt, and that's what brought runs home for the Cubs. And you just can't do that. You know, these games are, like we said, as the season gets later, these moments get bigger. These moments are so tight. These games are so intense and tight. You cannot fall off defensively like that. It was a bad decision for him to throw that ball in that spot. He should have just held on to it. But he did, and you lost three to nothing. But despite the loss last night, overall the last twelve games the Brewers are nine and three. Their starters ERA ERA is in in the mid two point five. Overall, as as a complete pitching staff, if you add the bullpen to that, I believe it's like two point seven four, and that's not counting last night. It, it, it's incredible how this pitching, this bullpen, has gotten stronger again which was one of the reasons why the Brewers were struggling for that time period. The bullpen is a strength for this team, and Council had been taxing them out. It helps a little bit that the rosters have expanded. It definitely helps that you have more off days. I believe the, the remainder of the Thursdays, the Brewers have off. So you have a, a, a multitude of off days to, to get these guys some rest, and you're seeing it pay dividends with the expanded rosters since September 1st began and the minor league season ended. With these off days to get all these guys some rest, it's paying dividends. So something that's been a strength for you, which is your bullpen, is now a strength for you yet again because these guys are strong. These guys are fresh. Lorenzo Cain has been hitting pretty decently. Christian Yelich has been hitting all season long, but he's been hitting pretty pretty decently. You kind of worry about Jesus Aguilar because he's he's kind of been up and down all second half long. I think this is probably the most baseball he's played in a season. Very long season. Still 31 home runs, 97 RBI. He's a big bat. He's a big worry for anybody pitching to that lineup, especially late in the game. He can definitely break the game open for you or he could tie it up or do something big with one swing of the bat. One guy that's really really starting to heat up at the right time, both offensively and defensively. Jonathan Scope. Remember, this is a guy who had, I believe, a 19-game hitting streak, or not 19-game hitting streak, but he had like 19 hits in his last 21 at-bats uh, with the Orioles before he was traded to the Brewers. He was swinging a very hot bat. He comes to the Brewers, and he goes absolutely stone cold. His defense isn't that good. The bat isn't that good up at the dish. 
people are calling this a horrible trade. I'm sitting here scratching my head like, man, I, 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 we know he's he's got great player capabilities in him, but we haven't seen any of that yet. Like, what's what's going on with him? Is it the pressure of a, of a pennant race getting to him? Is it the, the pressure of being traded and people expecting something out of him getting to him? What's the deal? He took stock of himself, kept working, kept pushing forward. And now you're starting to see why David Stearns, Brewers GM, traded for Jonathan Scope. He, he's, he's been swinging a really good bat in those defensive plays on last night's game. Phenomenal. And, and those are the types of things you need to do come postseason. And these games are very, very tight. Again, they're, they were postseason-like baseball games. So if he gets on track and you get a couple of those other guys on track, guys like Aguilar, guys like Shaw, Moustakis, you add in Kane and Yelich. Braun gets on a little bit of a hot streak. You, you have a, a top-to-bottom worrisome lineup for any pitcher. But again, the bugaboo on these guys has been they've been inconsistent. Again, they got shut out last night. That's just adding to the amount of shutouts I've had all year, which are already more than they had all of last, last season. So you kind of worry about that when it comes to postseason. You kind of worry about that when it comes to this stretch run in September going into October because every game is huge. Again, you're down two games in the division to the Cubs. You're only up a game and a half on the Cardinals for the top wild card spot. That's the top wild card spot. You got a legitimate three to four other teams. And one of them fluctuates because that 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 NL West is absolutely bananas right now. Those teams keep flip-flopping the lead. But you literally legitimately have four other squads that are gunning for that second wild card spot. You got the Phillies, the Dodgers, the Rockies, Diamondbacks. You know, and again, one of those teams from the, AL, the, the NL West kind of fluctuates. Well, all those guys are gunning for that second spot, not very far behind. So you cannot afford to lose ground not only to the Cubs if your aspiration is still to win the division. But you have to keep your wild card lead. You have to maintain that as well. Don't need another replay of the 2014 season and last season where you lost out on both wild cards after being in first place for over 100 days in the season and end up at home watching. Don't need that. This team is too good. I've said that before right here on this space. This team is too good to miss the postseason. They have got to be there. Got to be there. So, again, 9-3 and three over their last 12 games. The pitching staff as a whole, I'm talking about the starters and the bullpen, have been stellar in this stretch. They've been getting some timely hitting from those guys. Not last night because those 3 nothing could not get runners home. They had chances. Just could not get runners home. It's the stretch run. It's the stretch run. And as I said before, if you have a hot streak in you, which we're, we're seeing they do, you need to continue that hot streak. Your playoff lives depend on it. Game three of that huge, huge series against the Cubs. And this is the final season series against the Cubs. You hope to see them again in postseason if you do not win the division. Things stay the way they will or stay the way they are. And you win that one game wild card playoff. If that is the route you take, you will more than likely see those guys again. It's going to be a tight series. But game three of that pivotal, uh, that pivotal, pivotal, if I could speak correctly for a second, series against the Cubs is later on tonight. You hope those guys get it, get within a game of the division. You hope that ends up being a two and a half game lead over the Cardinals. You hope they stop winning. But you have to continue handling, handling your business, doing what you need to do and controlling what you can, which is what is in front of you. Let's go on to the Badgers here on State of the State on toss. And talk about their game Saturday against New Mexico. It was a win, 45 to 14. But if you checked in at halftime, <laughs> they were kind of in trouble. It was only 10 7 at the half. Jonathan Taylor was struggling. I believe he had 99 yards rushing, which is great for a first half, but he also had a fumble. He also had a touchdown. Horny Brook was something like two for four in the first half. He was not good. The defenses were getting after it. You know, the Badger defense, which was getting after it, but New Mexico's defense was getting after it as well. But I can't give full credit to New Mexico's defense because it was mostly Hornibrook being off. Taylor fumbling the football, turning it over. And again, last week, right here on Toss, I said, hey, 
Hornybrook has to be better. He can't be overthrowing wide open receivers. He can't be underthrowing wide open receivers. Taylor can't be fumbling the football and giving teams a chance to stay in the game. Those things happen yet again. And it's game two. You try not to be concerned, but it's game two. And this is the second straight game you've done this. As the season gets later, the moments get bigger. You cannot afford mistakes like that. If a receiver is wide open, you get him the football. You cannot be overthrowing and underthrowing him. You see a crowd of defenders around you, you hold on to that ball with two hands. You cannot be giving guys like that any type of confidence that they can hang with you. Team like that, like New Mexico, who many people feel are not on your level, you need to go and crush them immediately. You don't give them a chance to feel good about themselves. No, you go and bury them and let them know you're not on our level. We're going to continue to crush you until this clock hits triple zeros. But you didn't do that. You allowed them to hang around. It was 10 to 7 in the first half. But then the second half happened and Hornybrook got better. He really had only one really big time target that he liked to go to, which was A.J. Taylor. Five catches, 134 yards, and a touchdown. Really the only guy he was throwing to. Really the only guy who was more consistent in that that wide receiver spot. Again, you get Danny Davis back next week from his two-game suspension. Cephas is still in the world of trouble. Can't even speak about him. Maybe you found something here in A.J. Taylor. But besides that, Jonathan Taylor goes off. Ends up with 253 yards, a career high for him, and three touchdowns on 33 carries. He was definitely the bell cow. Held on to the ball, did not turn it over again. Showed you speed, showed you power. The offensive line leaning on guys. And again, this is going to have to be the recipe, especially as the season gets later. You're going to have to continue to wear those guys out, wear out other teams. That big offensive line has to continue to lean on those other guys' defense. Wear them down. Wear them down to the point where they can't block anymore. Wear them down to the point where they don't want to get into the backfield anymore. They don't want to tackle your running backs anymore. Taiwan Deal had a good game. Ingold, the fullback, had a good game. He had a touchdown run. Much like the Packers game the day after, it was a tale of two halves for, for the Badgers. But it's that first half. I mean, it's great. They won 45-14, but it's that, it's that first half. That still kind of has me with a little bit of a raised eyebrow. It's not completely up, but it's kind of raised. Hornybrook is still missing, guys. Jonathan Taylor's still fumbling that football. We're going to we gonna have to get this squared away. You got BYU this week. I believe that is a gettable game for the Badgers. You know, they're coming in into Camp Randall. Again, you have to squash those dudes immediately. Do not give them any kind of confidence that they can hang with you. Let them know that you are not on our level. You punish them for thinking that they're on your level. But next week opens the Big Ten season, and you have a difficult one, and we'll talk about it more next week on Toss, against Iowa. And that's always, always a tough game to go and get, especially when you go to Iowa, which is where the Badgers will be. But again, we'll talk about that more next week on Toss. But you got to get this one against BYU, and you have to be better against teams like that. Again, you cannot be missing wide-open receivers. You cannot be fumbling the football. You cannot be giving any team a chance to hang with you. Because you do that, and you do that in in the bigger games as the season gets later, oh, it's going to come back to bite you. It's going to bite you hard, and you don't want that. I believe this team is far too good to do that. So that's the state of the state. Packers in a dramatic comeback win. Aaron Rodgers is hurt. We don't know if he's going to play this week or this Sunday coming up against the Vikings at home. My money says that he will, but what an incredible season opening win. What a way to win on the first game of the 100th season of Packers football. Absolutely amazing. The Brewers have been on a hot streak, the hot streak that I pleaded for, the hot streak that I pleaded for right here on Toss. Been playing a lot better baseball, still have some baseball to play, but I asked for a hot streak and they're on one. Pitching has been phenomenal. The hitting has been pretty good. Keep that rolling. And the Badgers crush New Mexico 45-14, but that first half has my eyebrows up a little bit. Hornybrook's got to be better. 
Taylor's got to hold on to that football, but I love the winning result. Coming up next on Toss, we have to run the Toss Sweep, and we have to talk about other games during NFL kickoff weekend. What was good? What was bad? We'll go through it all. Coming up next on the Toss Sweep here on Toss. TossNationMedia.com is your home for the Toss brand of sports. You can find it all right there. That's the Trishan on Sports Show Toss, the very program you're listening to. That's the Toss blog, the blog that accompanies this show, as well as Quick Toss, which will be uploaded there very, very soon. But you can catch that on Instagram TV currently. You can find all that and more only on TossNationMedia.com. Welcome back to Toss, everyone. It's your main man, T-Square. It's just Thomas. Thank you so much for continuing on with us on this third anniversary of Toss. It's time for us to run the Toss sweep. There was there were other games other than the Packers and the Bears on this opening kickoff weekend for the NFL. And we have to get to some of the good and some of the bad of what I saw. Now, it's not going to be your conventional good and your conventional bad. I mean, obviously, we had some teams out there that looked pretty dominant. Jacksonville comes to mind with their 20 to 15 win over the Giants. Uh, obviously, they looked very, very good on defense. The number one defense in the NFL last season. It's looking much like they're going to be the same thing this year. Blake Bortles didn't lose it for him. Leonard Fournette running the football very, very hard, even though he did exit with an injury. You have to see. They believe it's minor. It's a hamstring, but those things tend to flare up. Um, they looked very, very good. Uh, so what did I see that I, that I felt was very good? Um, the Patriots. I know there's a lot of people out there that don't like them. There's a lot of people out there that can't stand the Patriots. I get it. I understand it. But they looked very, very good. And in particular, it was that defense that looked very, very good to me. Uh, over the years with the Matt Patricia defense, it was kind of a bend but don't break mentality. And I didn't see that bend but don't break mentality on this team. I, I think they were really, really dominant. I think they went after Deshaun Watson and made him look very average. You know, and this was a Deshaun Watson coming off of an ACL tear who probably would have been the rookie of the year last season had he been healthy the entire year. They made him look incredibly average, incredibly average, kept him in the pocket, did not allow him to go out there and make plays with his legs, did not allow him to make plays outside of the pocket, did not allow him to get Hopkins involved very much. They did not run the football incredibly well. I mean, they had a lot of carries, Lamar Miller, but it wasn't very a very good yards per carry average. So they looked very, very good to me. And then Tom Brady, I mean, you know, it wasn't a, a 300, 400-yard day like we saw from, from Ryan Fitzpatrick, of all people, or Drew Brees. It, it was well orchestrated. It, it's just what he does. So the Patriots definitely looked very, very good to me. Very good to me. And in particular, it was that defense. That defense looked very, very good to me. So what else was good? And people are going to scratch their heads about this. Like, how did you see the good in this? But we got to talk about it. The Cleveland Browns look good to me. Yes, I, I know people out there scratching their heads. I can see y'all raising your eyebrows up. The Browns, they, first off, it's their best start to a season since 2004. They're 0 0 and 1. They tied with the Pittsburgh Steelers. Steelers were up 21 7, I believe, going into the fourth quarter. And they subsequently gave that lead up. Ends up being 21 21, and that's where it stayed 21 21 after the overtime period. James Conner ran all over them. Yeah, I get that. You know, he was amped up. He's starting in place of Le'Veon Bell, who's still not with the team. I don't foresee him coming back anytime soon. So it's going to be the James Conner show on the ground. You know, he ran for over 130, had a couple of touchdowns. The Browns turned the Steelers over six times. Six. They were not able to capitalize on all of them. But they capitalized enough to get the tie, to be down 21-7 against this team with Ben Roethlisberger, with James Conner running all over you, with Antonio Brown and his skills that he brings to the table, with Juju Smith-Schuster. Guys who could go out there and absolutely fly, grab the football, and score on you in a hiccup. To hold them to 21 points and to come back and score 21 of your own 
to tie these guys and play another overtime period with them and it ends in a tie, that, that's something to talk about. That's something to, to build on. That defense looked pretty decent to me. And we're talking the, the Cleveland Browns defense. They, they, looked, they looked a little bit different. Looked a little bit different. And to be able to turn the Steelers over six times. I mean, offensively, you just have to go and capitalize on it. Tyrod Taylor for the Browns did not have a great day. Wasn't a great day, but he, he did just enough to get a tie. And it's going to be interesting to see how that quarterback situation plays because there, there's already calls for, for Baker Mayfield to come in there and be the starter after one game. I mean, you guys are off to your best start since 2004 at 0-0-1, and there's already calls for Tyrod, Ty, Tyrod Taylor's head. I mean, sheesh. I mean, it's one game. I mean, <laughs> I, I get it. You want better. I get it. You've been through the ringer. You didn't win a game last season. You want better. But you have to look at what they did all game. And I'm very encouraged by what I saw from them. I don't think they're definitely not going to go winless this year. I, I can tell you that. I can tell you that. They may not make the playoffs, but they damn sure ain't going winless this year. So kudos to the Browns for looking pretty good. Who looked bad? Who looked terrible, awful, horrible, no good, very, very bad on this opening kickoff weekend for the NFL. Both teams came from the Monday night games. And I think you all know where I'm going with this. Now, an honorable mention would be that first half. Well, obviously you got the Bills who were just ransacked, looked awful against the Ravens. How Sean McDermott still has a job after he started Nathaniel Peterman twice in horrible situations in two seasons, I will never have a clue. I just don't know what the hell they're trying to do out there. I don't know how he still has a job. Clearly, his decision-making is not the best. But that's an honorable mention because we knew they were going to be terrible. The Lions, my gosh. It was 17-10 to 10 at the half. You came back on your very first drive of the third quarter. Tie the game at 17-17. I'm thinking, wow, all right, we may have a good Monday night football game here. All right. Lions and Jets are going after it. And then the Jets subsequently go and absolutely throttle them. 48-17. to Jets win. Lions lose. Stafford, four picks, including a pick six. Sam Darnold, a rookie on the other side, threw a pick six on his first pass. Ever in NFL, but he recovered nicely with two touchdown passes. I believe it was 198 yards. Orchestrated this offense to do what they needed to do. Isaiah Crowell, 102 yards rushing and a touchdown of his own. This Jets defense is looking pretty good on the tile bowls, at least in that game. You know, it's one game, but they look pretty damn good. Matt Patricia, I don't know what you were thinking. I get it. It's a rookie quarterback on the other side. But to only rush three and think that you rushing three was good enough to get pressure and confuse this young quarterback, that was arrogant. That was so arrogant. Because clearly, clearly you rushing three was not enough. Something should have changed. And more times than not, he rushed only three. And you got your butts beat for it. So the Lions look terrible. They look terrible in that game. I don't expect them to continue to look like that. But I did not expect them to look like that, especially on the first game of the regular season. I did not expect them to look like that at all. They should definitely be better coming up here. Who else looked bad? Well, the Raiders looked terrible, horrible, awful, no good, very bad. And another team who looked really, really good were the Rams. They, they looked like a complete team, a complete team. Defensively, they got after it. You barely heard Ndamukong Sue's name called. You barely heard Aaron Donald's name called. And they still went out there and dominated. Only gave up 13 points to the Raiders. 33-13 win. Jared Goff didn't have an all-world game, but he was pretty decent. Todd Gurley didn't have an all-world game, but he was still good enough. Defense absolutely dominated those guys. David Carr did not look good. And, and, and honestly, you did that. A part of that, especially that interception, where the hell was he throwing that? My gosh, I have no idea where he was throwing that football. 
I don't know who he saw, what he saw, but he shouldn't have thrown it because they uh, apparently they were not there. That's a throw you don't make. But them looking so bad, you have to attribute that to the Rams defense. They're going to do that to a lot of teams this season. The thing that made me raise my eyebrow was Gruden after the game saying, oh, we couldn't get to golf enough and we couldn't get to Gurley enough. And we got to be better and find ways to do, to, to, to do that. And it's like, OK, I wonder why you couldn't get to golf enough. I wonder why you couldn't get to Gurley enough. Could it be because the guy you traded is now in Chicago and is absolutely wrecking shop and people were ready to give him the defensive player of the year award in that first half? See, you reap what you sow. You can't get to the quarterback. Your linebackers aren't speedy enough to get to the guy running the football. You're reaping what you sow. So I'm not going to cry any tears for this guy. I'm not going to cry any tears for him. If anything, it's unfortunate for the rest of the team. You cannot trade an all-world talent like Khalil Mack is unless you have something and someone in-house that could do something comparable to what he did. And they don't. And you're seeing that. And it's going to be a recurring theme all season long. They're not going to be able to get to the quarterback. They're not going to be able to get to the running back until he's, especially in the backfield, he's going to be yards up the field. They're going to struggle defensively. Khalil Mack was their identity on defense. The coverages he soaked up, other guys were able to go and eat. You don't have that anymore. So now guys have to go and prepare their own meal. And, and as far as that, that first game goes, you have no one that can do that. So I'm not crying into tears for you, Gruden. Not crying into tears for you. You made that decision. You got rid of one of the best defensive players in all of the NFL who showed you on Sunday that he is still one of the best players on defense in the NFL, can still be absolutely devastating to offensive game plans everywhere, and you're going to be having to deal with it. That, that's going to stain your legacy for the rest of your career. You traded a guy in his prime who was one of the best defensive players in all the NFL, came into the press, press conference after you got your butt beat at your first game subsequently the next day, and said, we can't get to the quarterback and the running back fast enough, and we have to find ways to do that. And you not understanding why you can't do it. You would think a guy who was away from the game that long and was in the booth and could see things from a different perspective would smarten up. But as soon as you traded Khalil Mack, that showed me that you didn't smarten up, John. You didn't smarten up at all. It's going to be a long season for you and the Raiders. This is Toss. All right, y'all, it's time for me to get on up out of here. This has been episode 40, the third anniversary of Toss and Tristan on Sports Show. Thank y'all so much for rocking with me for these last three years, man. Let's let's do it three more years and three more years and three more years and three more years after that. But again, thank y'all so much for the love and support. I see you, Portugal. I see you. I see the love. Thank y'all so very, very much for rocking with me. Hey, you know the website. TossNationMedia.com. That's TossNationMedia.com. Your home for the Toss brand of sports. You also know my my social media handles, but I'll give them to you anyway. At the two zero double. That's at the the number two, the number zero, the word double. That's on Twitter and Instagram. So I made it very very convenient for y'all to follow me on both mediums. And of course, Wednesday nights we got it on lock. You can catch myself and Professor P. On the Home Court Sports Show, that's Wednesday, 7 and 7 to 9 p.m. Central Standard Time. Look for Denim Mick Blue Jeans. That's the page. Or look for my page, Tristan Thomas. We're on live Wednesday night, 7 to 9 p.m. Central Standard Time. Home Court Sports. We got Wednesday nights on lock. But as I said before, it's time for me to get on up out of here. This is T-Squared, Tristan Thomas, reminding all of you that I'm the one and only. And so are you. Embrace it. Until next week, so long from Talk.